Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome your panel on Big Tech Under the Spotlight, Privacy, Transparency, and Regulation, moderated by CNBC's senior media and entertainment correspondent, Julia Burston. It's an old photo of you. Good afternoon. I don't know if my mic is on. Yeah, mine too. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I think the conversation that we're having today about big tech in the spotlight is perhaps one of the most pressing um, of our day. And while there's no doubt that technology has changed the world, connected people um, all across the globe, um, empowered people with new tools, democratized various things, um, it seems like not a week goes by that we don't hear about another instance of a couple of different big threats. One is privacy violations, the question of who owns our data and what's been done with it or what's being done with it, um, issues of manipulation, fake news, the spread um, and, and ability to very quickly spread, uh, spread manipulative um, data uh, and, and uh, incite violence. A third category, which unfortunately happens all too often, is this question of offensive content, the live streaming, um, sharing a video of, of shootings. Um, and then there's also this question of addiction, addiction to technology and trying to navigate how these devices that we all have in our hands all the time um, can be a tool um, to help us and not distract us from our lives. Um, so right now we have a, a pretty phenomenal lineup of folks to help us um, evaluate this. Um, Michael Beckerman from the Internet Association, Fadi Chahadi from um, Chahadi and Company, previously of the World Economic Forum and um, ICON. Also, Macon Delrahim, um, of course, Assistant Attorney General of the Antitrust Division from the Department of Justice, Tristan Harris, um, co founder and executive director of the Center uh, for Humane Technology, former design ethicist of Google, and Luke Nozick, managing partner at Gigafund Fund, also. Um, a co-founder of PayPal on the board of SpaceX. So by means of introduction, I thought the best way to get a sense of everyone's perspective is to ask each of the panelists to give one thing that they believe is a blind spot, either an opportunity that is not being acknowledged in the technology space or a massive risk that we are not talking about enough just yet. So I'm gonna ask each of the um, panelists to give, give us their one thought and then we'll go from there and dive into understanding what the challenges are, a framework for addressing the challenges, and then solutions, regulatory and otherwise. So, um, Michael, you want to kick us off? Sure, thank you. Um, and thanks for, for having me. This is a great conference. Um, <clears throat> I'll, I'll give two, two examples. Uh, the, the first is technology and internet platforms have become so ubiquitous in our lives and so part of um, everything that we do from you know, dusk to dawn is that we often overlook the overwhelming positive benefits that these companies and platforms and the internet in general has brought in our lives. And it's easy to focus on the negatives. That's not to say we shouldn't improve and there's not responsibility for the industry and the companies to do better, of course. Um, but as you look at policy and regulation, you should not be making regulation based solely on the worst case scenarios um, or these fringe cases. You need to look at the whole stack of positive benefits that come along from the platforms. Uh, the second is, the interesting part of the industry that we have today, this is really a great American export that we have. Um, most of the internet's users are outside the borders of the United States, but the vast majority of the jobs and economic value is here domestically. And on top of that, we have a unique system of, um, of social values, of human rights, of civil rights that don't exist in other parts of the world. And so as you're looking at regulation, um, you don't want to uh, unilaterally disarm the American companies that are doing great investment in next generations of artificial intelligence and next generation of technologies in a way that benefits, say, the, the, um, the Chinese companies that don't have the same um, rules or uh, political or social sensibilities that our companies have. And so that's another important thing that we need to look at as you look at the regulatory landscape, that we don't um, hamper our companies so you know, five, ten years from now the leading companies in the world are no longer U.S.-based. Julia, thank you. Uh, well, as an engineer, I'll give you a blind spot. Um, I do think deep fakes are a big blind spot we're not focused on that will actually, just like Cambridge Analytica, affect the next election. I think uh, for those of us who have seen how that technology works, I am concerned that we're not paying enough attention 
how to avoid having another problem. And just to, to explain a little more, you mean deep fakes in terms of manipulative video or photographs that, you know, can... I, I watched a deep fake video of myself. Uh, I couldn't believe what I was saying, and I was sure it's me. Uh, deep fakes are videos that essentially uh, machines create a video that looks just like you, behaves just like you, same accent, same movement of everything in my face and my hands, but the machine is making it say other things. Think of what this could do if it's released, I don't know, by some leader in Asia about something going on in Kashmir. Think, think how long it will take before there's uh, many people who lose their lives as a result. So extrapolate this to all the possible things. So that's a technical blind spot and a policy blind spot. We need to do something about this. Um, at the policy level, I'll give an opportunity as a blind spot. I do think that the governance systems of the 20th century have pretty much fallen apart in the face of the velocity of technology right now. And I think there's a huge opportunity to bring together public, private, and hopefully civic uh, leaders to form a whole new world order that is different from what we know today. Because technology doesn't understand borders, it doesn't understand jurisdictions, and the opportunity now is to devise a brand new regime almost, or a brand new system of governance, and I hope we focus on that before it's too late. Megan? Thanks, Julia. Um, next time I get accused of criticized for somebody not <laughs> believing what I've said, I'm going to use that. It wasn't me, it was the fake deep. Um, the, I'll stick with the area that I know uh, as far as a blind spot. I think one of the things over the next, I think, decade or so that could be a blind spot is that you know, the area that I enforce as the antitrust laws, uh, we have exported antitrust to over 138 agencies by last count. So these are folks, you know, in the United States, it took probably 75 years for us to get it right because we used to enforce against activity that was perfectly rational business behavior, that was good for business, that was efficient for consumers, and we would outlaw that. That really, it wasn't until some court decisions in the 80s that, you know, brought that, uh, to the four, and what, what I'm concerned about is there is no international code of what is the proper role of antitrust. What is, how do you uh, interpret it like we do in the United States? And could other countries use it as, um, you know, as a protectionist tool or as a, as a tool by which uh, it, it isn't intended to, which is really to preserve competition, but really to pick winners and choosers and, and use that. And that's an area that unless we work hard at it, could become a problem for the future, which devalues uh, intellectual property and reduces the risk for innovation. Tristan? <clears throat> um, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, I think the blind spot is, uh, there's this Mark Andreessen quote that soft software is eating the world. And if you pair that, what he means by that, obviously, is you take technology or software, and it can do any industry more efficiently than that industry. So you take software, and it eats up taxi cabs, and you get an Uber, everyone's going to use it, because it's just going to be more efficient, cheaper, et cetera. But what we're perceiving across the board right now is that Facebook and Google and, and all the companies, it's software is eating public parts of life. So we used to have areas of life like children's development, let's say, Saturday morning cartoons. But if you let software eat the world, you're letting private incentives and profit incentives eat the world. So we used to have this protected area of the attention economy called Saturday morning, and we regulate what gets shown to children. And now when you have YouTube for kids gobble up that part of the attention economy, now you have a YouTube algorithm run by 200 people in Mountain View deciding what 100 million, or sorry, what I think like 10 or 20 million kids see every day. And it's currently, I mean, the, because we've created these unregulatable systems, this sort of digital Frankenstein, uh, it's, it's calculating what to show people, and it doesn't know if it's good or bad, so it ends up showing uh, teen suicide videos, how to, here's how to commit suicide. It shows videos that, um, uh, for anorexia, if you started a teen girl video on a dieting video, it recommends anorexia videos, because that's more extreme. Uh, so then we have this other area of the attention economy that software is eating called elections. So we used to have this thing called the public square, 
and you might have um, you know, uh, governments deciding what should be in the public square or what should be counted as political speech versus non-political speech. Mm. But once you have Facebook gobble up elections, suddenly an algorithm is controlling that, that thing. So you don't have fair equal price campaign ads. We used to regulate that at 7 p.m. on Tuesday night, if Hillary Clinton wants to run an ad against Trump, it should cost the same. But if you let the companies gobble that up, we just destroy all the rules. So what we really have is deregulation eating the world. And I say that not because I'm, um, I want to regulate everything. I just want people to notice that for any area we had a protection, no matter what it was, you let software eat that and suddenly you've deregulated it because you have an algorithm choosing that's profit motivated unless you say, hey, is this supposed to be in the public interest? So that's a very broad frame that hopefully should open up some, some doors. Um, I want to go into Luke, but I first have to ask you to respond to that. Well, I, I tend to be a little bit more optimistic about uh, you know, what technology can do. And I think it gets to, first of all, I don't think it's unregulatable. As long as you have members of Congress, almost anything can be regulated. Yeah. Well, I'm not and, saying it's unregulatable. Oh, yes. Sure. Yeah. It, it, it may not be wise for them to do so, yeah. but I actually think there's a lot of efficiencies that's been created by software and by you know, a, new, a lot of new business models. Does it require you know, more attention to make sure, for parents, for example, uh, to make sure you monitor the kids? Maybe it creates new opportunities for software that parents could purchase and buy. I don't know if it's out there, uh, to be able to control and see what the kids will watch. So they don't, they're not watching Momo videos, something I recently learned last week about Momo, which my kids are totally frightened about. Have you seen that as the half chicken, half person who does very bad things over the internet? And these things will happen. But I think technology always brings some social challenges uh, regardless of what the paradigm is. And I think it just requires more attention and sometimes it creates more opportunities. The question is, so in that case, you can hire, I don't mean to, I want to let Luke go, but yeah. um, in, in that case, um, the, so you can sell a parent on some, some monitoring software or something like that, but let's say it's software eating the world when it comes to elections and the public square. So with Twitter, for example, uh, there was 17% of their users were thought to be bots. So 17%. So when you wake up and you're running a company where you told Wall Street, this is how many users I have, and if I have to respond to that, I can't force individuals to buy pairs of software to pay for the thing that's going to clean up the bots. We, we need to clean this up from a higher level. But software ate that part of the world, and so now we have a non-authenticated, verified form of speech where 17% of it up in January 2017 was from bots. And they didn't actually didn't have an incentive to take it down because there was no, they were actually be basically dropping their stock price by 17%. And very similar things happen with Facebook, YouTube, and, and the, other, the other companies. I want to continue that conversation, so, yeah. but let's bring yeah. Luke in here. So I think the, one of the biggest uh, things that's uh, hurting us here is uh, short-term uh, uh, founders and short-term investors. So at, at Founders Fund, we, we backed entrepreneurs that had a vision for a positive impact they were making with an, some incredibly powerful technologies. And that's what we would ask people is, well, why are you starting this company? That's a question we began to ask people. There was always a, some long-term purpose they had in mind. But the, the venture fund structure and the lean startup model are against long-term thinking. So the, the lean startup model that you're all familiar with, PayPal was the first version of this. We, had, um, we pivoted, I think, like four or five times in our business. And so it was very short term. We kept changing everything every few months until we had something that worked a little bit better and a little bit better. Um, and then w when you do something like that, your long-term mission goes out the window. Whatever you cared about in the beginning when you're founding the company, when you think short term, you can't have a long-term, um, you, you can't actually have an impact, even if that's what you cared about in the beginning. And the second thing is investors. Um, time horizon um, in, the, in, 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 in venture investors are at best five to 10 years out. And if you think about how a venture fund really works, it's much shorter than that. So if, if, if we actually have founders, I, I believe some of the ones that, that, that we are backing, a, that our, our intention at Giga Fund is, is, to, is to back founders that care about the, uh, having the, the greatest, uh, building the greatest companies in the world in, in sort of a 20 year time frame. Um, but also, if we could find uh, sources of capital that, that, that understood that that is where the greatest returns came from, then I think we could have a happy marriage and have a, a positive uh, uh, long-term impact uh, from, from these companies and these technologies. 
Um, so there are some interesting common threads here. One is the challenge, the need for a global standard um, to avoid this sort of patchwork of issues or the opportunity for foreign regulators to, to cripple um, U.S. companies. Um, and then there's also this question of aligning interests of stakeholders um, because you have, you have investors, you have employees, um, you have, so I would say investors slash shareholders, sort of early investors or, or public shareholders, employees, you have customers, um, and then you often have another category of, say, advertisers or partners. And I guess the question is, how do you align the interests of these different constituencies? And especially when you are dealing with companies that are dealing in data, in personal data, is there an inherent conflict between those stakeholders, or how can you align those interests? Mm. Adi? Or Michael? I, I mean, please. No, sure. I mean, I, I would argue that one of the unique things about the internet is that um, it gives more power to the individuals and to the users. And you see time and time again changes and upgrades to the platforms uh, to better suit the desires and the needs of users. Everything from um, more granular privacy tools or even times when uh, terms of service are changed and the internet users of that particular platform don't like it, you often see companies changing it back. Um, and the fact that there's a very low barrier to entry to create these platforms, you know, we, we were talking earlier in the green room about MySpace was, you know, this, this giant company owned by um, Rupert Murdoch and they had all the resources in the world and they were disrupted by, you know, a couple of kids in, in a dorm room that did it better. And that still um, emanates through all of these companies and platforms that they are very responsive to the users. And so those um, incentives are aligned in a way that doesn't exist in other spots. You know, you look at the airlines, you know, United Airlines, you know, they pull a guy off the plane, you know, kicking and screaming, and then, you know, what do you do? You're stuck and you're using United the next day versus online, you have a lot of different choices and, and people can decide what their clicks. Hmm. Honey, we're gonna weigh in there? Yeah, I do think that the number of parties involved in creating the right incentives has actually grown. It used to be that as a CEO, I needed to attend to my board, my shareholders, and I, I would do well. That's changed. The only thing that stopped Google recently from deploying some technology, as you've read in the papers, was the employees. The employees stood up to their employer and they said, no, you're not deploying this technology. Uh, and therefore, employees, as you mentioned, citizens, investors, users, all of us are now part of the equation of what creates incentives. I will also note a very good uh, set of uh, theories laid out by Anne-Marie Slaughter when she was still at Princeton about horizontal incentives, not just top-down incentives. So, and we use some of her theories at the World Economic Forum. For example, we came up with a safety norm for IoT devices so that you would know when uh, an IoT device includes some software that it met some basic safety norms. Well, how do you enforce that? How do you create an incentive for that? Uh, we used insurance companies. We brought insurance companies and they said, this actually makes sense for everybody. Why don't we put it in the policy? So if the company that makes these devices uses that norm, we'll reduce our, uh, our premiums. So there are ways to create incentives between all the players that are starting to show up in the market that are very powerful. Tristan, I know this is something you're very interested in, in um, your work um, trying to get companies to understand how to reorient, to make technology a tool for good and not, and it's particularly when it comes to this idea of the sort of the addictive nature of some of these services. Um, how are you trying to work and, and create a language um, to help technology companies understand maybe the potential to shift? Well, First on your, your question first about um, uh, what are the, the, the different constituencies that have to be speaking to cause change to happen. So speaking as, I guess, someone here on the panel who's sort of the activist among the crowd of saying we have to change these systems, what's led to the changes so far? It actually wasn't in the case of YouTube until advertisers complained about the suicide videos on YouTube that they actually did something about it. There are researchers who've been following these topics for years, raising awareness about it, but we have very, a very broken accountability system right now. So I, I work with the people who um, did some of the scraping on Facebook to, to discover the, some of the Russia pages, right? Mm. And basically it took non-paid civil society researchers, civilians, um, oftentimes ex-intelligence, uh, scraping 
some of the stuff that was happening inside of Facebook to find the Russia stuff saying, I think that this number is way bigger than the, and I think it was a couple million people that, that Facebook had estimated had, had been reached by the Russian propaganda. And it wasn't until they were hauled to Congress in the first, test, the first uh, inquiry um, back in September 2017 that they, uh, sorry, November 2017, that they admitted that it was 126 million Americans that had been influenced by Russian propaganda. So I say this not to go after the, the topic, but the structure. So, so far, what it's taken to make change happen is you can't just say there's a problem. Researchers are doing that for years and years and years and years. Nothing changes. Um, you can't say there's an addiction problem. I was doing that for years and years and years. Nothing happens. It takes a mass public awakening and oftentimes the pressure from the advertisers, a hearing from Congress members, a large media surround sound. Uh, but this is not, and the internal workers, actually that's another huge lever, is internal workers saying, yeah. hey, we don't, you know, we don't want to be participating in this. But that's not a functional accountability system. No. It happens after the fact. I, yeah, I it, want Luke to. There's a very important part of the accountability system that's gone in YouTube. The founders have gone. Yeah. And, and I, I think that the, the most important alignment um, vehicle in a company are the founders because they have the they have the purpose in mind of why they built the company, which, which for the ones that we backed at, at Founders Fund and Giga Fund, there's some long-term purpose they have in mind for that technology, some benefit for the world. And when you just put it inside a giant corporation, you can get a lot of money. Short term, you get a huge return from that. Mm -hmm. But then all you get is quarterly profit maximization. You get no humanity at all. You took the humanity out of it by by making it short term by removing the founder and. Fortunately, we had at least part of the way we succeeded at Founders Fund is we, we have, uh, to this day, hundreds of investments. We never fired a founder. And that was one of the reasons for it is because we thought that they would not just make the highest returns, but personally, I, I cared about having companies that were run by humans. Yeah. yeah and YouTube certainly is not, not that anymore, for sure. Yeah. Um, he, I'm sorry, go ahead. So in the case of Facebook, though, I mean, um, and this is actually a problem for the insurer's point, they're incentivized not to look for the problem. Mm. So they, they're not incentivized to say how much um, child pornography, pedophilia, this kind of stuff. Um, because as soon as they look, they're, they're obligated to know. So we have this problem where the, the most important that's, problems... That's not accurate. Look, I mean, particularly with these platforms, they, they care deeply about the, the, the user's safety and security. And it's not in Facebook's benefit or anybody else's benefit to have a site that's full of, of pornography or, or, or content that people don't like. Because if they go to see that, there's like, I don't want to be a part of that community, and they'll leave. And I think Facebook obviously has improvements to make, and they'll be the first one to admit that. But they've made real investments, both in human capital, hiring tens of thousands of people, as you're aware, to help moderate this, um, as well as developing AI and technology to find these things and take it down and do it. And in some areas, um, like as it relates to um, uh, images of nudity, it's very easy to spot what is and what is not, and they, and they take those down, and, and certainly there are probably um, things that they take down too much that sometimes people get upset about. In other areas, it's a lot more complicated. When you deal with um, hate speech or other kinds of things, um, the exact same term could be used in a completely acceptable way, and, and it also could be used in a bad way. And um, these things are completely, you know, they're iterating and working and working, but to say that it's not in their interest and that they have no incentive to fix it, that's completely false. Well, for the, they work on that all the time, and that's what they want to do is have a platform that's just... They work on the moral consensus issues, but they don't work on... I, I talked to people at Facebook about the addiction thing six years ago. They knew exactly about the problem. They didn't do anything. They said, oh, that's probably a problem, but we should wait till culture swings around to do it. And being someone who's on the inside working with the people who are, again, unpaid, working till three in the morning, trying to do their best to find whether it's how many fake accounts are there on Twitter, how, what are the mental health issues showing up with children? Um, this stuff doesn't get addressed until there's awareness. When there's awareness, it, it moves. But it, right now, it's falling on people who are on the outside to do that work. And that's, that's not a system we want. Also, on the, on the moderation side, so Facebook or, or YouTube, both, they've, in both cases, they've hired 10,000 content moderators. How many, how many of you have heard about this? They've, they've hired these moderators to try and deal with like, all the billions of pieces of content in every language. How many engineers at YouTube or Facebook speak the 22 languages of India where there's an election coming up? Uh, how many engineers at any of these companies speak the uh, emerging market languages where in many cases ethnic tensions like in Myanmar or in Burma are causing a genocide to happen because fake news is rising to the top and there's not that many people who are actually speaking that language in the market that they're in. And so 
It's as if, if you imagine a spectrum, take YouTube, for example. Imagine a spectrum, and on one side of the spectrum, you have the calm side of YouTube, like the rational, Car Walter Cronkite, Carl Sagan, calm side of YouTube. On the other side of the spectrum, you have crazy town. You have UFOs, Bigfoot, etc. And if you start someone, no matter where you start on YouTube, if I'm YouTube and I want you to watch more, I'm always going to tilt you towards this way, because that's always what's going to cause more watch time. And so in every language, they can hire 10,000 content moderators, but that's like hiring 10,000 boulder catchers when you've tilted the whole playing field. So every society is tilted in that direction. And three quick examples, a teen girl watches a dieting video, it recommends anorexia videos. You, rec you watch a 9-11 news video, it recommends 9-11 uh, conspiracy theory videos. They're, they recommended 15 billion times the Alex Jones Infowars videos, 15 billion times. And if you watched a moon, a moon landing video, it would recommend the flat earth videos. And uh, that's been a huge issue because conspiracy theories are being tilted like this in every language. And you can't hire 10,000 content moderators. I'm not saying there's this easy one-click solution, but if we're trying to get an appraisal of the harm. But this is also an area where companies are increasingly turning to artificial intelligence and to the power of technology to help fix these issues. Um, so I don't know if either of you, any of you want to respond to him because I want to move the conversation to the idea of data and the, the challenges there. Luke, are you, do you want to respond here? Well, you know, artificial intelligence is one, one of the areas where uh, there could be such a huge impact on society. Um, it's just a massive outsized impact. It's why we uh, actually supported uh, research in artificial intelligence. Both Peter Thiel and I had uh, supported it philanthropically before we even made investments in it just to, to, to uh, try to understand the impact on society that, that it would have. Um, and later on, we did investments in, in DeepMind and, and, and Vicarious. Um, the, uh, the, this is another, another reason why it's quite important that these algorithms are not simply uh, in the hands of sort of completely soulless, short-term profit-maximizing machines. Yep. So it's, uh, I'm looking forward very much to backing the next generation of entrepreneurs that are, um, as, uh, as I believe some of the ones that backed in the past, looking to have the use AI for positive and beneficial impact on society. And it worries me when people uh, take a cavalier attitude toward it and just say, oh, it's just automatically going to create jobs or create wealth or whatever it is. It, no, no technology is automatic. It takes a great founder that is shaping uh, it with intention and it is building into something positive. So we're talking about the potential of artificial intelligence to catch to, you know, both to do good and to do evil, you know, to create the deep fakes and to, to catch the manipulative content or the, the UFOs. Um, and on, on both sides of that coin, we're talking about sort of the data of manipulation, either catching it or creating it. But then there's also the personal data, and there's been so much conversation in the past year plus about Cambridge Analytica and, the, um, and, and Facebook's protection or lack thereof of, our, of our, so many of our different types of data, whether it's emails, um, or, uh, or I could go on, on sort of the, the, um, the, the way that data is handled. And I think this is a question whether we're talking about Amazon or whether we're talking um, about you know, advertising companies, data is the product. And um, Macon, you were talking a little bit off stage about the challenges of addressing the way data is handled in the US versus overseas and how different regulations think about the questions of data um, within a different, with a different language. So no question that you know, the ability to collect data is, uh, has provided a lot of positive improvements. But at the same time, it has created some challenges as well for law enforcement and for generally competition. We are seeing uh, the different challenges now. So uh, there's a big debate going on about some companies, a lot of the, you know, whether it's Amazon or Facebook or Google, they have so much data and then by policymakers saying that somehow there should be a requirement for them to share that data with a new competitor. Otherwise, they have such a, you know, such an advantage uh, over anybody else in a market that you'll never have competition. This is particularly coming from overseas. It's coming from overseas, but also some policymakers in the United States who also have been uh, talking about that. You know, whether it's called the essential facilities doctrine of antitrust, where they say, you know, uh, some area is, must, is a must have, it's an essential facility to get from point A to point B, and therefore you must share. Uh, you know, our capitalist system, our free market system, has frowned upon that. You don't force a company to share with a competitor. 
Uh, our Supreme Court has really admonished you know, us to not to do that. Uh, but it's a matter of public debate yet again. We treat at the Justice Department, uh, the, the antitrust division part, it, we treat data as an asset class that if a company has invested in to collect data, uh, they get to keep it. Now, if you're merging two companies that have critical data, just like any other two assets, we might require you to divest one of them, and that was done, I think, in the Google ITA merger and in other areas but from a, uh, a company using it unilaterally and whether they gain an advantage. Well, sometimes when you invest money, you gain an advantage and that's the whole reason to do so, whether it's investing in a patent or uh, in building a new, more efficient manufacturing plant. So we view it that way. Now, there is this issue of, in, and in some of the social media companies, that's been an issue of what called the network effects. When you, uh, you know, have certain efficiencies where it's a winner take all. Mm. There's a tipping point at some point that causes competition issues, meaning that somebody else will not be able to enter into that market. And that's an area that's largely uh, a challenge for us. A big uh, problem with uh, you know, artificial intelligence for us from a policy standpoint is a big part of what antitrust does and has, has done over the years is to prevent collusion from com by competitors. This is price fixing or market division which we treat criminally. And about 50% of our efforts is towards that activity internationally. With data, you can signal, competitors can signal where, unlike the old days, where you have a back room and people are signing agreements to not compete with each other. You know, if I lower my price, you know, or if I increase my price, will you guarantee to increase your price? And that's the way you can do that and also monitor amongst members of a cartel. With technology and algorithmic pricing, you can, in effect, do the same thing without ever having to have a horizontal agreement between competitors. And that could become a real challenge for us uh, by using those algorithms. And it's something we have been thinking about. We brought the very first case. This was somebody who was selling you know, posters and wall art over, I think, Amazon Marketplace. And uh, it was an international one. We actually extradited the person um, he got, you know, time served, and it was the very first of its kind. And it's an area that will present some policy challenges. But again, it's technology that has good, and it also poses challenges for everybody. And we have to be diligent, making sure the proper checks and balances are there uh, to make sure it doesn't do the social harms uh, and only harness the benefits from it. But what we're talking about here is a world where data, human data, personal data is the asset. So you said that's what we're sort of, this is the new landscape. And then that also raises the question of this idea of a data dividend, which has been introduced. Should consumers be paid for use of their data? And if there isn't a transaction like that, does there need to be far more transparency about what data is being collected and how that data is being used? Because if data is the asset, the question is, do consumers really realize that? So one issue you raise is, you know, is, is the data itself. What we term as a non-rivalous uh, mm. issue uh, is data. I can give you, unlike, unlike a $10 bill, where I may be only, you know, if something I have to give a dollar to to get the service, I can only do that 10 times. Um, my personal information can be shared with many people. I mean, an infinite number of people to whom I can give my cell phone number, my email, my name, my date of birth whoever cares about it, and because of technology, it's cheaper and easier for more companies to collect that. Uh, so it's different than currency that people give up, and many consumers give up their data in exchange for something else. The transparency and the consumer protection control issues are really important. So if a company has told the consumer, we will not do something, you know, we will not do X with your information. We won't sell it to a third party, we won't share it. If you give it to us and a consumer has relied on that uh, and they do so, then that's where, you know, the government should come down on them like a ton of bricks. Uh, the, the other challenge is you get all these click-through agreements that are six pages long and most consumers, let, you know, most Harvard-trained lawyers will not know uh, what the heck a lot of that means, let alone most consumers. So, that's an issue for, you know, for, I think for public policy, and we need to address that as a matter of, you know, what do, what are people consenting to, and that's a really important part of making sure the free market 
remains out there and people have informed consent. Yeah, I mean, there does seem to be a consensus that regulation, whether it's a, a global framework of norms or specific uh, regulations around data privacy in the United States, does seem to be inevitable. Um, Michael, give us your perspective ahead of the California privacy regulations going into effect next year. Um, what is the, you know, where are things going and what's, where do we see privacy yeah. regulations and the, the risks and opportunities there? Yeah, this is a, um, a very important area. I mean, a few things. One, we are living in you know, a digital data-driven economy that happens on and offline. And so for us, we're pushing uh, really hard for a strong uh, national privacy law that protects all Americans, regardless of what state you live in, both on and offline, to give people meaningful control over their data, um, that you can have transparency and be able to you know, delete your accounts and delete your information and actually know and have control over your information, how it's being used, and never be surprised. Um, and I think that's one of the key things. I mean, you're, Macon's point on these long you know, terms of service people are signing, it's, um, it's very complicated. People aren't aware of who has their information. And particularly today, I mean, you're signing a rental car agreement and then you never see it again. And that's very different than, you know, if you do something online where you can, um, you know, revoke that or delete your account. And um, in the economy that we have today, you have data brokers where they have more information on you than you realize and have any, you haven't even heard of the company, you've never signed up for them, they need to be included in this. Or a personal pet peeve of mine or the credit reporting agencies who have you know, these massive breaches and you never signed up for the, the service in the first place and all you can do is pay them $5 a month to monitor it. And so all this needs to be taken into account and, and Congress needs to act, um, I believe, this year um, to give us something. And particularly when you think of um, competitiveness with Europe and around the world, the Europeans have GDPR, which is obviously not perfect either, but at least it's a, a tangible law that has a name that people can point to and say that's the protection for Europeans. And here in the United States, we do have a patchwork. There are protections that exist, and the FTC is a, um, is a meaningful agency to um, come down on companies that do something that's wrong and not of the interest of consumers. But we do need something here in the United States that takes an American approach that gives power uh, to the people um, over their information so you're not surprised and protects people equally across all 50 states. And what you're seeing with California and a patchwork of state laws that are coming into effect, um, I think that's gonna be even more confusing for individuals. And when you look at startups and new companies that wanna um, come and, and compete nationally, they're gonna be at a huge disadvantage to the existing players who are gonna be able to hire the extra lawyers and everything else. Um, and so it's in everybody's interest that we do have a national law. And Fadi, you're looking even m much more broadly than that in terms of a global system global norms, so it's not just a, you know, eliminating the patchwork in the United States, but eliminating the potential patchwork overseas. Yep. Um, wh what is the solution here? Well, indeed, just as a reminder, uh, if someone launches a new internet application in Cairo, all the laws of our country and every state are meaningless, and because our kids will access that application in their bedroom here in LA from a server that is outside of our jurisdiction. Uh, the, the, the internet creates a transnational sphere we have never regulated. And so we have a problem. When, when Vint Cerf and Bob Kahn and these guys designed the early TCP IP and IP numbers, they did not put a geography in them. They designed this space as a transnational space, not even an international space, a transnational space. And therefore, we have a problem that if we come up with wonderful rules, maybe it works today because the 10 biggest digital companies in the world, six are in the US and four are in China, right? So we pretty much have a concentration today. But that's going to change. Sooner or later, we'll have a lot of services from countries we can't even reach. And so the challenge we face, Julia, is to create a transnational norm system that can start working even when we are outside of the jurisdictions where laws would apply today. And that's never been done before. Our closest attempt to do that is climate, and I need not tell you how well this has gone. Uh, now we have this digital space that's, that's everywhere. It's global. We know how to regulate the networks. That's why we have the FCC here and similar ministries around the world. We know how to regulate the logical infrastructure of the internet. That's what I ran for four years with ICANN, and that's pretty much settled how we do that. But we have no clue 
yet how to build norms that are transnational for everything we talked about on this panel. There are efforts right now to solve this. Um, and my fear, and I'll finish with this point, <laughs> is that unfortunately, we're still at the extreme. You have either companies saying, we shall self-regulate. We don't need norms. We know we're good, we're going to do it. It's not easy. Google just fired their latest ethics board, right? It's not easy to self-regulate. And then you have governments coming down saying, we will regulate. We know exactly how to do that. That's our business. There's a power struggle now going on. And frankly, neither model will prevail. We have some ideas on how to make this work. And some of this is coming out actually in the second half of this year from various bodies to start defining a whole new way of governance that balances self-governance with governmental regulations. Do you want to respond to that, Lou? You know, there, when founders create a company, they have a choice about what kind of business model they want to uh, build. And uh, I guess, first, just as an aside, you have a choice about whether you can sell your company or not. And DeepMind chose to sell, and they wanted that ethics board. That was one of the things they wanted from Google. And now look what happens. Yep. Um, so happens when you sell. Um, the second thing is you have a choice of your business model. And let's just compare, for instance, Apple and, and Facebook. Um, both companies I, I actually respect quite greatly. Um, Apple's business model is it gives you um, this, you know, it gives you this great, this great device. And, uh, oh, it's not in this pocket. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> and you pay a lot for it, but um, you can do whatever you want with it. And they actually, they have quite a bit of privacy protection compared to most companies. But it's interesting, I think one of the reasons, it's not just because maybe Steve Jobs is cared about privacy more inherently, but because his business model was not making money off of getting more data and selling it to advertisers. And if you found a company where at the beginning, in the very beginning of your company, in the soul of it, is getting as much data as possible and optimizing ads to, to your customers, then you're going to have some incentives that are not quite aligned with, uh, with caring about your, your customer's data. You start it from the beginning in a way that's going to do that. So what and do they do? What does Facebook do today? Their entire business model is based on this premise I'm, that I will collect your data and I will leverage it. So what, I mean, what would you do if you were Zuckerberg now? What, 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 where do you go? They're, they're, the position they're in is impossible. Yeah. I mean, it's like yeah. they're, they're Exxon, right? They're an Exxon who created climate change and they don't have a way of not being Exxon. They also own the satellites because they, they, the only ones who know how bad the harm is, like, who knows what's happening in the crime scene? Like the crime scene for every election or whatever in the world or every kid's issue or any harm issue, who has the data on that? Only the company. So for every crime scene that's actually a harm that's caused by technology, imagine like you're, you're creating pollution, but the only people who own the satellites who know how much pollution there is is also that company. So that's why we need much more aggressive action because I would trust the companies a lot more if I heard them recognizing this. Now, you could say they fully recognize this but they just don't want to say it out loud because they can't because it just invalidates their whole, whole business model. But instead what I hear is, no, the advertising business model is fine, people like ads, which is just not a right way to, to characterize uh, the issue. But, but so Tristan, you're, um, you started off thinking, working on this issue of time well spent and attention, and now you're expanding your work and talking about sort of the equivalent of an inconvenient truth, but for, um, for technology and, yep. and what it means for our lives. But what does that mean in terms of what you're, how you want to approach companies, regulators, um, what is it that you're advocating for? What framework should people be adopting to understand what the next risks are that are coming and what we could do about them? This is such an immense topic. I mean, it's, it's just, uh, um, so we, we just had this big presentation on Tuesday that was an inconvenient <clears throat> truth for tech presentation um, and said that we're currently treating these seemingly disconnected problems tech addiction, polarization, fake news, bots, uh, radicalization as separate, like they're happening just totally unrelatedly, but they're actually all connected to an extractive attention economy. When your business model is extracting data and attention out of people in the race to the bottom of the brainstem, I have to go lower to get it. I have to start fracking attention to split your attention into multiple streams. So now I've got you paying attention to five different things and I'm selling like credit default swaps, tiny little slices of attention to 20 different people. Uh, so that, which is, I, when I say this, by the way, I, this is 
no one evil in the tech companies. I, I'm not accusing people in this. This is not about people. These are, everyone I know is actually great. My friends started Instagram. I love the people a lot. But they're trapped in this business model that is this race to extract attention. And when you realize that, like being in an extractive energy economy and saying, we have to make this broad-based transition to a regenerative energy economy, which is what we're in the middle of doing, and it's taken many years, and it involves shareholder activism and policy and internal employee activism and the public and media and documentaries and all that stuff. It's very similar now. So we have an extractive attention economy, and we have to move to a regenerative one, because just like in both cases, there's a finite resource being managed, which is the limits of human attention. It takes nine months to grow new human attention. And instead of treating it as something sacred or something worthy of protecting, like a national park, which we do, we actually say, hey, we don't drill in national parks, theoretically. We have some laws around that. Uh, but we're, we're not putting protections on elections or other things like that. So I think this is a new negotiation of a social contract, much like what he's, he's talking about with global governance, uh, combined with a new social contract that says when technology starts to gobble up parts of the public life, whether it's children's health or the public square or elections, what is the new social contract by which its business model is in service of the thing that it's, it's connected to, as opposed to extracting from the public's conversation. Macon, I have a question for you, if I Sure. May. And I have a comment about the last and, one. And, yeah, and, and now you get two of sure. them. So when you talk to some tech companies, they say, so you want to make that whole new social contract. You want us to dismantle how we're taking data to do business with it. And in reality, we should just underscore that many companies bought data from Facebook that don't get mentioned and used it as well, including Apple, including Microsoft, including others, bought data from, from them. But the question that I get asked often is, China, our main competitor in the technology, let's say, drive we're in, they collect data from all their citizens, all the companies in China, with no limitations. And this data fuels their massive AI investments. So there is also a almost not a national security, but a national competitiveness question that says if we're going to start putting all these limitations on our companies, how does this position us against China? And use someone in the middle of this, how, how, how do you see that? It's a, it's a great question and an important question because, you know, we are limited by something great called the Constitution in the United States. And, you know, the Constitution was really written to provide privacy for individual freedom against the government, which is why we have the Fourth Amendment. And unfortunately, sometimes, as you know, the Justice Department can have access to certain information, but I think it's a good thing in our society. They have a completely different process and a different government that they can do things. I mean, you know, earlier today I was talking about competition in the cell phone industry, and you know, there's some barriers to entry in the United States. If you wanted to go around and start a new cell phone company, there are some limits, spectrum, licenses. China can just grant you a license. You know, they can decide that through the provinces and all of that to, that in the next 48 hours you're going to have enough licenses to start a new you know, cell phone company to provide whatever, and they can do that. But that's a different governmental system, which is a broader issue and way above my pay grade, and I think to the four founders' pay grade. Uh, but you touch on another important point in China, is that in my trips there, and I'll try to usually meet, before I meet with my counterparts in the government, with the uh, American, you know, the American Chambers of Commerce, which are um, U.S. companies and their representatives there, uh, and we'll have a meeting or a breakfast or at the embassy. And what I have heard repeatedly in China is where the government decides long-term plan in a particular sector whether it's solar, whether it's artificial intelligence, cell phones, whatever it might be, self-driving cars, the government has an investment. So now you, you, you know, imagine, they'll, they'll find a technology, it might be third rate now, but you know, remember when Lucky and Gold Star were the TVs that Korea brought into the United States 25 years ago? Now it's LG and it's Absolutely. top of the line, yeah. or Japan, Datsun was not a great top of the line, Infinity is. Uh, so China will, will acquire a company, and it could be a U.S. company who's willing to sell at a 20x multiple. And then they will attach the government fund. So now you have an unlimited private equity fund attached to that company. And then on top of that, they say, you know what? 
will give you access and, and the protected access to 1.4 billion users. Which company here will not succeed in that type of a business model and become the dominant player in that sector if the government chose to do so? That's a real issue. And you know, when you have state-owned ownership in the, some of these factors, it's really a, uh, a policy concern that I know people in the government are paying attention to, and we should. And I, I think you had a thought to follow up on, I guess, what Tristan was saying? Was that, or, because I have another follow-up here. I think here. I, I was, and I forget what uh, uh, the topic was. Okay, well, so, so let me, let me ask a follow-up. Extra yeah. Extractive Christian. attention economy and regenerative, making that transition, that's helpful. No. Thank you. <laughs> My memory just, fails. It's probably <laughs> just not to any country's advantage, and I think you, if you weren't already going to say this, you could maybe say it better, to have, to have an extractive attention economy right. on their citizens. But we're basically depressing critical thinking, attention <laughs> spans, education, children's mental health. China would be laughing at us for basically like, like submitting ourselves to an extractive attention economy, diminishing our capacity in the world. It's making us dumber. It's making our political conversations more outraged, Chris, more polarized. We, we've been in the attention economy prior to the internet. You know, I mean, you, your analogy no, 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 earlier no. In, in the, on the panel about the, the cartoons on Saturday morning, I remember, you know, that was before the internet and they were free. And the reason they were free and it wasn't is managed because they, by had, they had advertisements that was suicide and the commercial. Let's look at the commercials were, were you know directed to kids and that's that was the whole thing. I mean that's how the economy goes. By around. the way, those were people those make were supported product. by advertising. What's that? Those programming yeah, was supported by advertising. They were, so they somebody were supported, they were supported advertising. by advertising. And look, there's there's certainly things that need to be corrected on the internet. There's also major major problems that we have in society. And I think one of the big maybe blind spots to the, bring it back to the beginning is there's so much attention solely put on the harms in society that exist online and completely ignoring the effects that are happening in the offline world. Everything from bullying, I mean, I remember I mean, all of us as kids, there was bullying in the schoolyard um, before the internet and it exists now online and offline and we have to address these in both places. The issues of, of racism and hate it's, and everything it's, else, it's amplified certainly though. does, it, sure, it, it does get amplified online. But, no, but I, I but can also be very specific about do. why the amplifier of a technology And works. even if you are able to somehow flip a magic button and remove all hate from the internet, it would still exist here in this room and it would exist in society. And so Agreed. we need to address let's, all Let's let Tristan and then Megan wants to respond to something. Think of human nature as a distribution. You have Gaussian distribution. You have good sides of human nature and bad sides. And they're fairly evenly distributed, right? I mean, whatever. But there's a good and there's a bad. But technology is tilting us towards the bad because it's breaking all the natural feedback loops. If I say something that hurts you, I see it in your nervous system. I, and my nervous system forces me to feel it. So as a kid, if I say something and it hurts you, my nervous system makes me feel the thing that I just caused you to feel, and I can't help but feel like there's something wrong there. Mm -hmm. Technology subtracts that feedback loop. We have paleolithic emotions that we're stuck inside of, and we're, we're basically taking that away. Um, the, the, there's, I, we could go on forever about this. I mean, the, the, the amplification rates are so enormous because, so outrage, it turns out on Twitter, for example, gets a 17% lift for every word of moral outrage you add for, to, a, to your tweet. So if you want to get a lot of traffic, you just add, it's disgusting, it's horrific, it's abominable that such and such. Just each word you add, you increase your retweet rate by 17%, and specifically 22%, the more, uh, for, uh, you get more lift for your echo chamber. So your political echo chamber, if you're left-leaning or right-leaning, you say it, and then it gets amplified 20% for every word of moral outrage. So technology, we've always had outrage, but of all possible things that your mind is exposed to in a day, and there's only so much time in a day, We've just filled up the, the pipe with outrage. And that has effects that spill out into the real world because if you don't even use Facebook or Twitter, you still live in countries where your elections will be decided by them. Okay, I just wanna let your, because we're almost out of time and we have so much more to cover. What, uh, I think what Tristan was talking about earlier about the public policy issues and some of the, you know, some of the considerations that really should be in the sphere of policymakers. Uh, one of the challenges that has been, and, I, and my friend Michael uh, may not like what I'm about to say, but I think that the tide may be changing, um, is that the technology companies for about 20 years or 24 years have had this immunity from liability that was put in by Section 230 of the Telecommunications Act yep. that was put in there with the child, what was legislation called the Child Online Protection Act that was intended to keep kiddie porn and things off the internet, which was struck down by the Supreme Court under the, because of the First Amendment. However, the liability immunity that the online service providers got 
in exchange for keeping, you know, kiddie porn off of the internet, stayed in there. As long as they do not manage or review the content, they are immune from almost any lawsuit. This past year, for the very first time, and I think uh, despite opposition from some of the online community, Congress, for the first time, was able to break through that Section 230 immunity for human trafficking. And this started with the issue of Backpage and having, you know, underage or prostitution or whatever was going on these websites, and for a very limited purpose. Now, the question is, you know, if people are providing bomb making over the internet or others, you know, we might have some First Amendment limitation for regulation. But if you have liability that goes with the companies, if they're in fact, you know, redirecting somebody who wants to learn about anorexia right. to teen suicide, they could be, you know, it's a way to internalize externalities through liability suits. And I'm not a huge fan of private lawsuits for that, but also not a huge fan of immunity from harm that the companies may do. But in fairness, so I mean, maybe the minute and three seconds is not enough time to get into um, the importance of uh, Section 230, but the, the key thing about that, that law and that protection is not to just give immunity for companies. It's, it's the one tool that the companies have and enables them to be good actors and take down and moderate the platforms and take down uh, the things that we as society wouldn't want on there. So a great example was uh, Twitter took down a white supremacist account I think it was here in California, and the guy sued Twitter. Why are you taking me down? I'm a white supremacist. I deserve to be on there, whatever. And Twitter won the case because of this. And so without this law, Twitter would be, have to either say, we're only allowing a very curated group of people, and people would have complaints about that, only having you know, known entities and, and, a, and a much smaller group of people. Or they would have to say, we're not taking anything down, and you'd have the most you know, garbage version of the internet that you want. So 230 allows us the platforms to stay. Or they become safe. selective in what they can take down and what they don't, then they become really controlling uh, you know, the, the, uh, the access point for viewpoints yeah. and ideology. Uh, we are out of time, but I want to let Fadi have a, a last word here, because I know you're working right now on addressing these issues on a global scale um, and having sort of a global framework for this. What's the yeah. thought on how this can actually be applied in so practice? Just one, one final thought on this. We will need to start decoupling the enforcement of rules from the design of rules. Because the internet and technology is moving so fast, our governance systems cannot keep up with it. The velocity and complexity of technology requires that decoupling. So we need a whole new system to create norms that can work globally. Uh, I also want to mention, because of Tristan's input, that there is a need also for a higher level authority that starts thinking about the compact between all of us and the technology world. Uh, Pugwash, if any of you remember what that is, Pugwash in Canada was where Albert Einstein and many of his friends got together and started designing new rules for how to deal with nuclear power when it became a real problem. We kind of need a Pugwash for the digital age. It is time for leaders from the technology sector from the ethics background, statesmen and stateswomen to come together and actually start designing the rules and the norms for how we advance from here. Um, I want to thank all of our panelists. I also hope you all will continue to have these conversations offline as well, because I think that this has been a really valuable and lively conversation. Tristan, Luke, Macon, uh, Fadi, and Michael, thank you so much for joining us here today. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for attending. Please make your way to the next session.